Rob will shoot me. Alright. Bernie, we leave us in prayer this morning, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this beautiful day we have to come here and worship <coughs> you, Holy Father. We're so thankful for your Son who came to this earth and brought your will and lived without sin. He was rejected by the Jews and crucified, buried, and raised the third day. And through that shed of that blood, we have remission of our sins. I pray that you'll be with us this day, Heavenly Father. Help us to live as we ought to live, Heavenly Father, in everything we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right, we're still talking about faith. Uh, last week we started talking about in, the, in defense of the Bible's inspiration. And we're going to continue that thought today, uh, headed a little different direction. Um, the claims of the Bible's inspiration can be drawn from basically two sources. There's external sources and then there's internal sources uh, or evidences rather the external evidences are the scientific the uh, uh, artifacts archaeological things that can be used to support uh, the claims of the Bible the internal evidences is when you take passages of scripture that can't be explained in human terms or human reasoning um, and realizing there's no other way that these things could come together in Scripture other than a superintending intelligence behind it. I mean, and we'll talk a little more about this later, but you put 40 authors together to write on the same subject, uh, what's going to usually happen with that? But it all blends perfectly. And we're going to talk more about that in here in a little while. Um, well, look at first of all the the unity of the scripture for for our faith. Uh, there is evidence of diversity. <clears throat> the Bible shows a level of unity that, in human terms and human reasoning, is really inexplicable. I mean, how else would could you explain scripture outside of human reasoning? That, that that's the only way you could do it. Um, you think about how it was put together and all the different writers. What, what was Nehemiah? He was the cupbearer for the king. Uh, Peter was a fisherman. Luke was a doctor. Uh, Matthew was a tax collector. Uh, Moses was a shepherd and Paul was a tent maker. And these are just a, a part of the, uh, of the writers of the scripture. This is a, to say that they're a diverse group of men would be an understatement because they ride on so many different subjects over such a long period of time, about, about 1,600 years. It seems that the Bible would be full of inconsistencies and errors and flaws and incongruities. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense within human reasoning that it would all come together perfectly. Um, <clears throat> if you took 40 scholars, all with PhDs, and asked them to write a 20-page essay on the cause of World War II, you would have more disagreement than you would agreement. There, there's no way they could get all their stories to, to mesh perfectly like, like the way the scriptures are. Um, <clears throat> there's no way that 40 writers could put the scriptures together and have it as harmonious as it is by mere coincidence. There's no way. Uh, there's a theme of the scriptures. The Bible is the story of one problem, sin, with one solution, and that's Jesus. Each book of the Bible complements every other book of the Bible in one simple unified plan. Um, 
What does Moses and the wandering children of Israel have to do with Jesus dying on the cross? What did Moses and the wandering children of Israel have to do with Jesus dying on the cross? Well, we know that Christ died for all mankind. Of course. He died for all mankind. The law was not able to take away sin, just kind of roll it forward, as we call it. How could we understand that we need Jesus if he were sent first? I mean, God could have sent him first, but how could we know, how could we understand that we actually needed him? Um, We learn from the stories of the Old Testament, in particular the children of Israel, that man is not able to live up to God's standards alone. That started all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve couldn't stay away from him one single tree <clears throat> they couldn't obey one single command that one simple command they they disobeyed and as one preacher said ruined it for everybody um there's there's uh, some symbolism when you look back of course with what we know now about christ or god's love and that those kind of things you can see the jewish people when they came out of egypt he, he uh, delivered them. You know, you can make some analogies there about uh, God delivering us from sin, you know, through Christ. And uh, then once, you know, when they were in the wilderness, they were having some trouble out there. Was it uh, uh, being bitten or uh, sickness or something? But And they had to look upon the... Uh, mm-hmm. the uh, Fiery serpents. Yeah, that's what it was. They were being bitten and they had to look upon the... the um, Had to look up on the, the, the brazen, serpent on the pole. Brazen, yeah, yeah. yeah. pole. Yeah. But there again, you have the symbolism of Christ there in a way uh, <clears throat> I thought of because Christ was lifted up on a cross and, you know, take away the problems we have of sin if we accept him on his terms. And um, they were delivered by that kind of... And I find it interesting that a lot of today's medical symbols, and I think Hibsy uses this, have a serpent on the pole. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. That's, yeah. I guess that's part of that. Mm-hmm. And it all traces back to, mm-hmm. to that. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I, I, I omitted a point. Look at the factual accuracy, too. Uh, the Bible claims to be the inspired Word of God. So, in, in so being, it should be accurate in whatever it discusses. If it's inspired by the Word of God, then it should be accurate. Uh, Paul said that God is not the author of confusion, 1 Corinthians 14, 33, uh, but rather of truth. Jesus said, uh, Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth, John 17, verse 17. Um, A lot of critics have suggested that Moses could not have written the Pentateuch because <clears throat> the act or, or the art of writing had not been established until afterward. So how could Moses write it if there were no way to write? <clears throat> but in 1933, there was, somebody found a pottery water pitcher that was unearthed, <clears throat> and it had an inscription on it of 11 archaic letters which is it has been referred to as the earliest uh, Hebrew inscription known to man that predated Moses so that <clears throat> that proves that writing was around before Moses showed up <clears throat> the code of Hammurabi was written several hundred years before Moses uh, was born some secular writers have commented on it Uh, Josephus confirmed that Moses wrote the Pentateuch and other non-Christian writers have credited Moses as the author of the first five books of the Bible in Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 1 Isaiah mentions 
Sargon as the king of Assyria. And Isaiah had been accused of making a mistake because some claim that Sar or have claimed that Sargon was not the king of Assyria at that time. But historical evidence had been unearthed that he was the king of Assyria at that time. <clears throat> so Isaiah was right all along. Sir William Ramsey disputed the accuracy of the events that Luke wrote in the book of Acts. But Sir William Ramsey also himself dug up Asia Minor and convinced himself that he was wrong. That Luke was right all along. <clears throat> There's a prominent figure in the ar archaeological community named Nelson Gluck. He said it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever con has even controverted a biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which conform in clear outline or exact detailed historical uh, statements of the Bible. <clears throat> For instance, more than 30 names of emperors, uh, high priests, Roman governors, princes, on and on, uh, are mentioned in the New Testament. And all but a handful have been verified. In no single case does the Bible let us down in geographical accuracy and whatever accuracy can be checked concerning scripture every minute detail has been found correct every time every time <clears throat> and there's some more proof it was uh, one of the best known meteorologists lived you know in the Old Testament you remember him Best known meteorologist. Yeah, Elijah wasn't, said it wasn't going to rain for three and a half years. <laughs> That's what made you go out on that limb today, would uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he said it's not going to rain till I say it rains. That's, That's right. right. Amen. And it didn't rain. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> which, <laughs> which, uh, I've always wondered in my mind, you know, they're in the middle of a drought. And he challenges the prophets of Baal yeah. to, to to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder <clears throat> what the king is saying when Elijah comes up with all this water to cover his sacrifice with. Where did he get it from and why are you wasting it, you know? Yeah. We need that stuff. Um, the writers of scripture, they were often separated by uh, different centuries. Well, all of them were separated by centuries. Uh, but yet their stories dovetail together perfectly. Uh, they have what one writer says, astounding accuracy. And that provides additional proof of the Bible's inspiration. Uh, look in uh, Exodus chapter 1. And look at verse 11. Therefore they set the task taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Python and Ramses. Alright, and flip over to chapter 5 verses 6 through 8. So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying you shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Uh, therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Excavations have been made at Python that reveal structures <clears throat> that the lower layer of bricks is full of straw. The middle layer of bricks have less straw and the upper layer of bricks have no straw which coincides with what Moses wrote there um, in Acts chapter 28 and verse 20 Paul alluded to his chains uh, Luke wrote that 
Paul spoke it, but Luke wrote it. And then Paul wrote about his change again in Ephesians 6 and verse 20. And then he wrote about it again in Philippians chapter 1 and mentioned it four different times. All this stuff is tying together, uh, proving even more uh, the accuracy of Scripture. All right. The prophecy of the Bible. Uh, the Bible's prophecy is completely foretold in the most minute detail, and it is painstakingly fulfilled with precision, the greatest precision. And that has confounded critics for generations. Uh, look at Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41 and verse uh, 22. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were that we may consider them and know the latter of them, know the latter end of them or declare to us things to come. Well, uh, one writer says, it is one thing to make the prediction, it is entirely another to see that prediction actually come true and be corroborated by subsequent history. Um, you can, uh, I can't help but think of Nostradamus and when 9-11 come around 18 years ago and all the talk was on Nostradamus talking about twins falling. What does that have to do with what happened in 9-11? Or what happened on 9-11? Uh, there was a lot of talk about other so-called prophecies of Nostradamus. Uh, one of them had to do... I can't think what it was. But he set a date for something. He set a, within a, uh, a time span for something to happen. And he was like 100 years off. And I keep thinking that... Um, a passage in Deuteronomy that basically says if if the prophet makes a prophecy if he's not 100% accurate then you don't need to worry about him because a true prophet in making true prophecy is going to be 100% right 100% of the time uh, but then again you got the end when is the prophecy fulfilled that's when what amazes you and me comes into play uh, there are five things that must be in order for prophecy to be valid. <clears throat> Number one, it must be specific. There can be no room for guesswork. Nothing to make you think, well, I'm not sure about that. Uh, it has to be specific. Number two, there must be a sufficient amount of time between the prophetic statement and its fulfillment. And there must be no chance whatsoever for the prophet, so the so-called prophet, to influence the outcome. Number three, the prophecy must be stated in clear, understandable terms. Because if it's something that's vague, then you can make it mean what you want it to mean. Number four, <clears throat> the prophecy must not have historical overtones. A uh, true prophecy should not be based on past or current societal or economic conditions. And number five, a clear, understandable, exact prophecy must have a clear, understandable, exact fulfillment. Yeah, a lot of times people... Uh you know, um, that are predicting things and all that, you know, even if you had a 70% accuracy rate, they think it's pretty good, you know, a lot of people, if you're speaking forces or the weather or stock or anything else, you think, well, this guy's pretty good at hanging them. But, you know, he's just, he's just studying history there and trying to make a guess at it, that's all he's doing, you know. And, yeah. Um, 
and, and you see these guys, there's one of a TV show or two that came out, you know, this, but these guys are trying to uh, help you connect with those that have gone beyond. And all yeah. that. You know, I remember watched a little of it, just see what they do. Oh, yeah. they, they try to, you know, get some similarities going. They learn how to ask questions to move to something else, you know, mm -hmm. to, to get an answer. So it's manipulating the oh, audience exactly. rather than really not know anything. Y'all ate eggs and bacon oh, for really? breakfast. <laughs> Can you think of anything that advertises 100%? Well, I mean, Ronnie Millsaps loves not even 100%. 99 to 44, and that's a reference to ivory soap. I don't know the uh, funeral home or the uh, undertakers. They may be, yeah, I predict a little bit there, yeah. <laughs> we guarantee you if you ain't coming back. Well, I, well there, 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 may be, there may be two things that are 100% death and, 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 and well, it goes along with that. Taxes, taxes is optional. Yeah, death and pregnancy, you can't be a little bit pregnant. <laughs> FG and Bomb is pretty well lit, you know. Yeah. Somebody was discussing over the last few days, I don't know how the conversation came up, how they, uh, well, maybe it was something in news about something that kind of revived, you know, they thought they were dead. <coughs> and um, years ago, they used to have a little bell with a string, you know, tied in with, you, uh, yeah. with a casket thing, put you down and if you came to down there, you could ring up the thought. <laughs> you know, you know. um, but after the embalming days, I think that's pretty what went away, you know. Yeah. And certainly from the... Uh, Has anybody gotten into the young, young living essential oils? Oh yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Little yeah. Bit. yeah. Uh, My so. wife looked, I, and I like those things yeah, too. They, they actually work. They do. My doctor t told me, yeah. I, I've been using some old while back and see my doctor, and, and he told me, he said, man, those things have been around thousands of years. He said, there's something to them. Yeah. They, I keep using them then. Mm -hmm. But I noticed on the, the Thieves uh, hand sanitizer, yeah. it's only 99.99%. <laughs> Nothing's 100%. But you know, one of the few things you will find 100% on is uh, prophecy of Scripture. That's it. Um, there's some prophecies concerning the kings and nations and, and cities. Uh, look at First Kings chapter 13. First <clears throat> uh, Kings chapter 13 and verse two. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. This prophecy was made more than 300 years before Josiah came along. And guess what? It was fulfilled... 100 percent um <clears throat> in isaiah 44 and verse 28 i'm not going to take time to read that uh there the writer talks about uh cyrus the king of persia it's mentioned more than 150 years before he came along um there are more than 300 messianic prophecies in the old testament Jesus is referred to as the prophesied one. Uh, and some of those uh, passages, uh, Genesis 3.15, he would be born of woman. That coincides with Galatians 4, 4, uh, 4 and verse 4. Uh, Genesis 22.18, he would be of the seed of Abraham. We find proof of that in uh, Luke 3.34. Genesis 49.10, of the tribe of Judah. Hebrews 4, 17. And then there's 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. He would be of the royal line of David. Luke 1, 32. Micah 5, and verse 2. He, from Bethlehem. Well, that coincided with uh, Matthew 2, and verse 1. He would be born to the Virgin Mary. Isaiah 7, verse 14. <coughs> and we find that true in Matthew uh, 1, 22. Um... He would, he would come in order to bruise the head of Satan. Genesis 3.15. And we find uh, that coincided with Galatians 4.4 4 and uh, Hebrews 
12 through 14. And there's a lot of other things about Jesus' ministry and how he would be treated that came to pass. Isaiah 53 verse 3 talks about that he would be rejected and he would know grief. Proof of that on the cross. Uh, Psalm 41 and verse 9, he would be betrayed by a friend, Judas, uh, for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11 verse 1. And we find that fulfillment in John 13 verse 18 and Matthew 26 verse 15. All right, now this is the scientific foreknowledge of, of Scripture. This is the stuff that really gets my attention, that amazes me. And, and we talked a little bit about this last week with the placement of the stars in the universe and all that and so forth. Um, but looking at the scientific foreknowledge of the Bible, looking at the field of astronomy, if you look in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22, Isaiah said, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. The circle of the earth. Uh, the Hebrew word for circle literally means spear. The earth is a spear. We know that. But what did the people of Isaiah's time think about the shape of the earth? It's flat. They thought it was flat. Isaiah was right all along. Um... Look at Job, uh, chapter 38, <clears throat> and look at verse 19, Job 38, 19. Have you entered the springs of the sea, or have you walked in search of the depths? Well... That's the wrong verse. Hold on. Verse 19, not verse 16. Uh, where is the way to the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place? Well, until the 17th century, it was believed that light was transmitted instantaneously. Boom, there it is. But that's not true. And we demonstrated last week. Fernie, you weren't here last week, were you? We demonstrated last week, but like that, and that seems instantaneous. So we talked about the speed of light being what? 186,000 miles per second? That's the reason it seems instantaneous in here, but it's actually moving. Um, but yet Job makes reference to this, and this is God speaking to Job. <coughs> Also in uh, chapter 38 and verse 24, by what way is light diffused or the east wind scattered over the earth? What is it that separates light? You think back to seventh grade math or science class, you know what this is. Prism. Prism, yeah. Prism separates light. How did Job know to write that light could be separated? All right, also, that's from the field of astronomy. Look at the field of oceanography. Uh, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 7. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. I have read that the Mississippi River, when it's moving at normal speeds, dumps approximately 6,052,500 gallons of water every second into the Gulf of Mexico. Where does all that water go? There's a hydraulic cycle. How did Solomon know about this hydraulic cycle? You know, one of the things that really irks me, I mean, I take this personally, it drives me crazy. You walk in a motel 
and everything's nice and clean and ready to go and on that perfectly made bed is a note that says we'll be happy to replace your linens every day and replace your towels every day but help us to conserve water and save the earth if you will and reuse them where's it going Who's, who's throwing the water out that we can't use anymore? And here's one of the things, I, I, when I'm working at the Space Center, I, I love telling the kids this because you get that, ooh, look everywhere. Um, talk about living on, on the space station and where do they keep all the water from? Well, they recycle what we don't want to recycle. They filter their urine and extract the water from it and that water that's that's filtered from the urine is more pure than the water you get out of the water fountain here. It is like 99.9 percent. Um, so I ask, ask these kids, you know, they're 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, who would drink water that's been filtered from urine? No! Nobody wants to drink that stuff. It's nasty. No, no. And I asked him, I said, but have you ever drank water before? Yeah, yeah, we drank water before. I said, well, guess what? You know where I'm going with this, don't you, Chuck? You drink water that's been filtered from urine, whether you like it or not. Because of what Solomon talks about here, this hydraulic cycle. But the thing about the motel drives me nuts. I can't stand that. You know, if you want me to help you conserve your energy, keep your utility bill down, I can deal with that. But don't, don't mislead me that way. All right. Uh, no, it's global warming, you know. Right. <laughs> no, it's, it, no, 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 no. It's climate change now. Oh, climate change. Yeah, they give up on global warming. Oh, climate okay. change now. Yeah, they figured out it's not hot enough. Yeah, 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 yeah no doubt. Just wait to fall. It'll get cooler. Um, what's got me, you know, the Lord talks about how the world ain't, and it ain't gonna be the way they want, the way they call it, that we're gonna end it ourselves. You know, global warming, all that stuff. Back to Job thirty-eight, verse sixteen. <clears throat> Um, and I read this already, but I'm going to read it again. Have you entered the springs of the sea, or have you walked in search of the depth? Well, guess what science has found over the last, I don't know, 100 years or so, a couple hundred years. Springs in the sea, trenches in the sea. How in the world? This is Job writing, but God is talking. How did Job know about that? amazing in it because now with all the technology all we have in the world we see and know about all this stuff mm -hmm. back then they didn't study all that other than what God what they knew yeah. you know, uh, they by, couldn't get to God's it. gift get to yeah it they couldn't then. get to it when I joined space the Navy and everything about space they already knew when I joined the Navy I'm, talking, I'm sitting in a recruiter's office in a recruiting office on North Parkway and he asked me if I'd be interested in going submarines and That'd be interesting. Yeah, I might do that. <laughs> and uh, so we talk a little more, and, and I don't know what to expect out of the Navy no more. Um, and we talked more about submarines, and I had had a good score on my ASVAB test. He said, you can do this. You can go on a nuclear sub and do whatever. And, and we talked more about submarines. And, and then he let it slip. He said, in the whole history of the Navy, we've only lost two. two I said, Lost two what? <laughs> lost two submarines. I said, what do you mean lost two submarines? Blew up? Hit with torpedoes or what? He said, no. He said, lost. I said, what do you mean lost? He said, well, they went up under continents and couldn't get out. And that's when I started to change my mind about submarines. <laughs> two is too, too many. Um, so, I, no, I, I was on an aircraft carrier. I'm proud of that. <laughs> Real um, safe job there. Say what? Real safe job in there. Yeah. Sure there. Yeah. Um, it's like saying you want a hand grenade or you want to stick yeah. down a dynamite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, Genesis 6 and verse 15. The instruction of God given to Noah how to build an ark. Genesis 6 15. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. 
guess what? The the ratio <laughs> of the arc was 30 to 5 to 3. And science has learned that that is the perfect ratio for a large boat to be built with, for seaworthiness. Yes, so that, that just blows my mind. How did no one know that? All right. All right, in the field of physics, look in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. All right, I'm fixing to mention something about a subject I don't know anything about. This is what I've read from other books, thermodynamics. The word finished there in the Hebrew means complete, never to occur again which according, according to Bert Thompson, the writer of the book that I've been reading, uh, says disagrees with the first law of thermodynamics. That first law of thermodynamics states that neither matter nor energy can be created or destroyed. It simply changes forms. Um, Hebrews 11... I'm sorry, Hebrews 1 and verse 11. Hebrews 1 verse uh, 11 says, They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment. Alright, go to Isaiah 51. And verse 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish away with smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment, and those who dwell in it will die in like manner, but my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not be abolished. Psalm 102. And verse 26. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them, and they will be changed. What do you do with old garments? I'm talking about past the point of donating to somebody. Burn and throw away. You throw them away. They wear out. But this is uh, biblical... Statements that the earth is wearing out. Which Bert Thompson says agrees with the second law of thermodynamics, but I don't know what the second law of ther thermodynamics is. Anybody know? <laughs> Tyler. I think. <laughs> <laughs> something bad. There's life cannot come from non life. There's something's always wearing out and going, going, going away and getting worse, isn't it? Really getting better. <laughs> That's why they talk about uh, That's true. evolution, you know. We're not evolving and getting any better anymore. <laughs> All right. We can also look at the field of medicine. And I think we have enough time to get this finished. Um, and we won't take time to look at all these passages. But uh, in the field of medicine, in, in Leviticus 17, 11 through 14, Scripture teaches that life is in the blood. Life is in the blood. Uh, what do the red blood cells do? They carry. Is it? They what? Now go ahead. You... What, what do the red cell, red blood cells do? They carry oxygen. They carry oxygen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Without oxygen, we. Die. So therefore, life is in the blood. <laughs> How did Moses know that? Genesis three fifteen uh, teaches us that male and female possess the seed of life. But in Moses' day, the common position that only the male held the seed of life. How did Moses know that? Uh, Leviticus 17 and verse 15. An animal that has died naturally must not be eaten. Well, do you know anybody who would do that? I just couldn't bring myself to do it. There's an old man down in uh, Homer, Louisiana, where we live, 
one of the finest men ever met. Super nice, super cool. But if he finds a turtle or an alligator that's been hit by a car this morning, he will stop up and pick up the roadkill and take it home and cook it. But he knows if it died naturally, he's not gonna touch it. Uh, which <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, his son-in-law killed a uh, alligator, a four-foot alligator, and brought it to him for him to cook. Had it in an ice chest in his kitchen, and his kitchen's only not even this big, and uh, had it in an ice chest. Well, guess what? His son-in-law didn't actually kill the alligator. He didn't knock him out. He come alive. He didn't. <laughs> But he got he got him dead though he got him dead. Oh, All right. Um, another thing from the field of medicine: the Jews have held the the pig, swine as unclean animals. And they claim it's unfit for human consumption. Uh, they're scavengers. They ingest parasites and tapeworms. But guess what? If they're cooked properly to the proper temperature, bacon ain't gonna hurt you, or the sausage, or and and I find it interesting, that, and I don't know that I could ever try this, but I've always been told that uh, a pig is the only animal you can eat everything of. And my uncle used to make crackling bread and cracklings, and that was good. I miss that. He died back in 1988, and that's the only that's one of the biggest reasons I miss him. Pig uh, brain, you know. Pig brain, I've had. You've got pig brain in the grocery store. I've had it before. It's been a long time. But, uh, South me. But how did the Jews know about that? <laughs> All right. Uh, in Deuteronomy 23, 12 through 14, Moses instructed his people to bury human waste products. And then the passage it talks about because God's going to be walking through here and he doesn't need, he doesn't want to see any unclean thing. <clears throat> but there's a practical side to that too. Isn't it? Sanitary. Um, the Black Plague swept through Europe in the Middle Ages because people would take Go their fast. human waste and throw it out on the street. Well, guess what's happening in San Francisco right now? Exactly. Uh, Genesis seventeen twelve, God commanded Moses to circumcise all males on the eighth day. <clears throat> well, uh, there are three factors needed for proper blood clotting. Uh, you got to have platelets, you got to have vitamin K, and you got to have prothrombin. I don't know what prothrombin is, but Bert Thompson says that on the eighth day the amount of prothrombin is elevated by 100% to, to help clot, clot the blood for the purpose, well, with, with the, uh, the circumcision, so the baby doesn't bleed to death. How do they know this? How do they know this? All right, two more from the field of biology. In Genesis chapter 1, several verses there, verse 11, verse 12, verse 21, Verse 24, Moses wrote that things produce after their kind. If you plant corn seed, Vernon, are you going to grow watermelons? No. No, you're going to grow corn because it produces after its kind. Uh, Acts 17, verse 25, Paul talks about the fact that it is God who gives life to all. There have been a lot of people who have tried to create life or produce life spontaneously but all have failed. How did Paul know that it is God who gives all life? All right. A lot of people have attempted to discredit the scriptures. They have all utterly failed. Um, the Bible has been compared to an anvil that keeps on wearing out hammers. All right. That's all that I have for, for this morning. Any, any questions or anything? Vernon? When I'm working in these gas things, I talk about uh, you need everything from a pig. We had a market manager, a lot of the blacks came in late in the Saturday afternoon, and he'd say, get your offals. 
Officer on the south. He's talking about pig ears, pig tails, pig feet. Anything that come off the hog. And then snap that stuff up, boy. Mm-mm-mm. Fun times. Fun times. <laughs> <laughs> well, up there,